So welcome to Trauma and the Spiritual Path. My name is Karalia. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the land, the Whenua. And to acknowledge the Tangata Whenua, the people of this land, Ngāti Whātua. To acknowledge all those who have walked the land before us over the last few hundred years. and to acknowledge all those who will walk the land after we are gone. Acknowledging the colonial history of this land and the need for decolonization. Acknowledging the trauma that has been caused in so many ways through war, through the dishonoring of Titirifi and through policies, laws, regulations, and just downright racism. Acknowledging the journeys that each one of you has taken to be here today, and the obstacles that you may have needed to face, and the support that you may have needed to call on. And acknowledging the friends and family who are not here, who may have made this possible for you to be here. And acknowledging all of your ancestors, all of the ancestors. May we come together out of love. May we come together out of a desire to know the truth. And may we come together for the well-being of all beings. Mm. So we'll begin with practice. You're welcome to leave your eyes open, just focus on at one point. You're welcome to close your eyes. Just let the body come into a comfortable position. It's totally okay if the body wants to move a little to find ease. You're welcome to hover at the back and stand. You're welcome to come in and find a spot. There's always a spot if you dare to peek your way in and you're like, I want to sit down. And whatever you're doing, whether you're still finding a spot or you're dropping into your body in a seated position, just bring awareness to the felt sense of breath. Just really noticing what it feels like in the nostrils as you breathe. And just allowing as you do this. As you come into awareness of the felt sense of breath, there is there are spots right down the front, right? So if you're bold and brave and want to come in, do it. <coughs> Be aware of the felt sense of the breath as it comes all the way down into your body. What does it feel like? And as you're noticing that, notice if you feel a little distracted by movement around you, just notice that as well. This is integrated practice where there is no longer any separation. There is just what is arising and being aware of it. So we're aware of the felt sense of breath and the nostrils and the body. And then becoming aware of your whole body. How does it feel after a day or two of festivaling? Just be aware of the felt sense of your body. And as you're aware of your breath and aware of your body, also allow yourself to be aware of the space, the sounds of the festival, the pulse of the beat, the voices talking. Still aware of breath and aware of body and just allowing the sounds and the feel and the smells and the taste and the sights, if your eyes are open, of the space to wash through the awareness that you are. 
Let yourself be aware of all phenomena as it arises and subsides, thoughts, feelings, sensations, sounds, smells, tastes, sights, feelings. And just notice what is there for you right now. How are you in this moment? And I invite you as we move through this presentation, which will be a talk and satsang style, call and response, questions and answers. I invite you to stay aware of your breath. Stay aware of your body. Stay aware of everything that is moving through the awareness that you are. And so this becomes an integrated practice, right? You're listening to me talk to what might arise in the space and you're in meditation at the same time. Stacking, very efficient. So effective if you've got a busy life. And people are like, I have no time to meditate. I'm like, yeah, right. You just don't want it badly enough. No, just joking. They just don't know how, right? It's like every moment can be meditation. Scrolling social media, be aware of your breath, aware of your body, aware of, ooh, envy, ooh, comparison, ooh, no, I don't feel so good. Be aware of it all in the moment as it happens, right? So today's topic is trauma and the spiritual path, and when I teach, I teach from direct experience, you know, and I draw upon teachers I've studied with, books I've read, etc., but for me, I feel like the most truth, the most authenticity comes from sharing what I've directly experienced, how I've synthesized it, and what I found useful and beneficial. Now, what I found useful and beneficial may not necessarily be useful and beneficial for you, right? Because every single person has their own individual journey on this path. So I'm not saying, do what I did. Nah, you know, you're not me, I'm not you, we're different. But what I would love is for you to understand the spirit of curiosity and the spirit of inquiry and the spirit of openness and the spirit of exploration. Because those principles of curiosity and openness and inquiry right, and exploration, that is what will lead you on the path. So I'm hoping that by sharing some of my experience, some of my learnings, that it will give you some context for the territory that you might be navigating, right? Okay, so I'm noticing that I'm feeling a lot of vulnerability at the moment. I'm just going to acknowledge that and name that. I've had a very interesting four or five weeks that has been taking me into some deep places as I begin to discover that I may not be who I thought I was after all. And um, that's part of the path, right? We have self-images and, and ideas of who we think we are and then they're shattered completely. And for me, one of those moment, moments came when I was 29. This is what this meme was about, sex, drugs, and mostly yoga. Um, I was 29, and I'd been living overseas in Canada for about eight years and traveling the world and trying to find myself as a human. And I was seeking so hard out. You know, I was reading all the books, and I was deep diving into yoga, and I was meditating by myself a lot, often on mushrooms or cannabis. And I was also doing a shit ton of recreational drugs and I was completely, totally, absolutely unaware of the trauma that I was carrying. I had this idea that I had my shit together. <laughs> um, and then I fell in love, um, deeply in love with this amazing man who just rocked my socks off often. And uh, we, we had the most extraordinary sex of my life. It was like, it literally blew me open on many levels. And at the same time, I was doing a lot of yoga. And at the same time, I was exploring with mushrooms and cannabis. And I was kind of coming off the ecstasy and cocaine, but I'd given that a serious nudge out the door as well. Um, and that combination of things, I do not recommend this. Can I just say, I do not recommend this at 
all. It is a recipe for... I ended up in a psych ward. That's where I ended up. I ended up in Lionsgate psych ward in the middle of Lionsgate after going to my first festival with my fiance and my best friend who he had the hots for and I was trying to like set up a threesome because he really wanted it and I really wanted to make him happy but I didn't really want it because it was making me feel really insecure and like, oh my God. <laughs> it was intensity, right? And so what I didn't know at the time was the trauma that I was carrying. So I had all these internal mechanisms for suppressing vulnerability, not speaking what was in my heart. I had no idea how to talk to my fiance about how I was feeling. I didn't even know how I was feeling. I was really, really good at pretending I was feeling things that I wasn't feeling, right? Yeah. So my self-image <laughs> of being this like high achieving, like I'd won a, a national award for writing a screenplay the year prior. You know, I, I was runner up to ducks. I was like invited to honors at university. I had this self image of being this incredibly successful person who was going to achieve great things and then wham, hello psych ward. And that definitely wasn't on my life script at all. And it completely shattered me in more ways than one. My fiance broke up with me. I had no money, I had no job, and I had to leave Canada where I've been living for eight years. I had to leave my crew and my life. I was doing a lot of go-go dancing. I freaking love go-go dancing. I was a freelance journalist and I was a, a waitress as well. I had to leave it all and come home to New Zealand, which was the place I'd run away from when I was 21. Um, and I'd been diagnosed bipolar. Um, and at the time I kind of knew, I was like, I think something spiritual might have happened to me. But I didn't say anything to the doctors because I didn't want them to think I was crazier than they already thought I was. Um, so I came home and that was when, like, because I'd had this awakening, and this is the interesting thing, right, is that in that awakening, I stepped sideways in reality and experienced reality in a completely different way. And it was like, oh, whoa, damn. Like, I knew everything. Everything was clear. Like, it was extraordinary. But I wasn't grounded and I wasn't speaking truth, and I was scared shitless. And so the combination of the not groundedness and the terror and not speaking the truth sent me into the psychosis, right? So I come home and I have to fully put myself back together again, feeling like an absolute failure. And feeling like at 29 that everybody else was on the corporate ladder, everyone else was on their way to success, everyone else had their shit together, and here's me, 29, fucking crazy, you know? And it had rocked my nervous system completely. Like I remember going to job interviews and they'd ask me questions and I, my brain didn't function the same way anymore. And they'd say something like, oh, tell me about this company that you worked for, what was the name of it? And I just couldn't remember. And I was, felt like I was the flakiest thing ever because I just, I couldn't function. Nervous system rocked, emotional system rocked, mental system rocked. So I deep dived into yoga, meditation, and started teaching, and eventually discovered that I was carrying a whole lot of trauma. Right? And in the last eight years, the main body of my work with people has been working on the mental, emotional level. Like I taught physical postures for about 10, 11, 12 years. But then I just, I wanted to go deeper with people. You know, I wanted to go further than the postures could take me. So I started working with people more directly where I would run retreats and people would come and we'd do practice, but then we'd do a check-in. And when people would speak, what I would find is I could just tune in and sense and feel where they were and just ask them a question, right? And in asking the question, things would be revealed. So in the last eight years, I feel like I've done this deep dive PhD into how trauma functions in the system, working with people and working with my own self. And in the last three years of uncovered trauma, I didn't even know that I had, that I was still suppressing from myself. And that took me back into the deepest darkness again. And that was, it was like being back in hell and going, fuck, I thought I was through this shit. I thought I knew, you know, all of that stuff came up. And what I uncovered at the bottom of that was deep self-hatred. Um, but the beauty of it is I uncovered it and I have the tools now 
to work with things. So when I uncovered and felt the self-hatred, it was like, oh, okay, awareness of self-hatred. What does that feel like in my system? Can I hold the self-hatred? Can I embrace the self-hatred? Can I love the self-hatred? And in Tantra, we talk about devouring, digesting, and dissolving. So whatever happens, whatever emerges within the body-mind interface, what we're seeking to do, and this is the trauma in the spiritual path, right? what we're seeking to do is to build a capacity to meet it. Right? And this is the critical thing, is that in order to meet what is there, one, you have to be able to refine your levels of awareness, expand your uh, capacity to sense things so that you can sense what is going on. Right, and so this is where physical practice is really, really important. You need, I mean, I did decades of physical practice to get me into my body because I was completely disembodied, totally disembodied, disassociated all the time. So physical practice on the spiritual path is absolutely critical. That will get you into your body. That will refine your levels of awareness so that you can begin to sense what is actually going on within you, right? But it's not enough, and a lot of people stop there. There needs to be orientation to awareness, right? So when we began this session, and I asked you to become aware of the felt sense of your breath, aware of the felt sense of your body, aware of all of the sounds, right? What that's doing is it's starting to, it's not creating a separation, it's not creating a witness because that perp perpetrates separation. What it's doing though is meaning that we're no longer identified with the feelings and we're able to hold, contain and feel the feelings. And this is critical. You need to be able to contain and hold and permeate and fully feel and be immersed even as you're holding and containing. And on the path, this is the sh Shiva aspect or Shiva aspect, consciousness, awareness, essence, nature. It is the aspect that is awakening to what you are, right? So from the perspective of working with trauma in the context of the spiritual path, embodiment, and then orientation to awareness. And then you have to build your nervous system capacity to be able to be with intensity, right? Because when we have trauma, right? Quick definition of trauma. Trauma is not what happens to us. It is how our system responds to what happens to us. So two people can go through the exact same experience. Say two people are in a car crash. And for whatever reason, one person might just roll out of that car crash and you know, do whatever they do and process and not have any residual patterns or anything. The other person might come out of that and find that their nervous system is shot, that they're having PTSD symptoms, that they can't drive a car anymore because there's so much terror in the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so that's the trauma. It's not what happened, it's not the car crash. It's how the system has responded. And what I recognized from my journey, so at 29 when I went through what I went through, I thought that that was like the biggest traumatic experience. But now, <laughs> once I started to recover things from childhood, I realized, I was like, oh shit. It was what happened to me when I was two, when I was three, when I was four, when I was five, that embedded the patterns and the patterns of the trauma, my relational patterns, my complete lack of trust in humans, particularly as a collective. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, that was embedded way back then, right? And it wasn't until I started to become more aware of what was arising in the system that I was able to start to track these patterns because I had come up with so many coping mechanisms, right? So when it comes to, to trauma, the way that our, our system will respond is it will generate patterns that makes the system feel safe. So for some of us, we might become the good girl or the good boy, because if we're good, we don't get yelled at. If we're good, we get ignored. That's also a good thing sometimes. Um, you know, if we're good, then we're safe. So we become so good at being good that then our self-image becomes that of someone who is good. 
and then if we do something that we deem as bad then we'll feel really bad because we've just violated our own sense of self-image and there'll be a shit ton of guilt and shame that gets generated and then that guilt and shame will be stored in the system you know and all of this starts to build up over time right so when it comes to the spiritual path it's kind of like the way i see it is that when we're unconscious we're building up patterns and we talk about samskaras samskaras undigested emotional experiences impressions from the past that we haven't had the capacity to fully feel so they get stored in the system right and all of that gets stored up stored up stored up and then we come onto the path and now we're starting to do the things that are going to start to slowly unwind and dissolve this but what it means is we might start to fall apart we might start to break down we might start to have mental health crises because we're finally starting to look under the lid underneath the coping me mechanisms like my high achiever self who was really good at being that high achiever that was a coping mechanism right and it's not the, the whole of what I am, it's an aspect of what I can be, but it's not who I am. So at 29, to have that self-image shattered, because I went into the psych ward and high achievers don't go into psych wards, um, you know, it just, my, the whole ground of my beingness, of my life, dissipated. So, when it comes to working with trauma, one is to recognize that I mean, in some ways, the spiritual path is all about the recognition and the dissolving of conditioning, right? And trauma is an aspect of conditioning, you see? The interesting thing is that you know, all those patterns that we create around trauma are about ultimately keeping us safe. Safe from abuse, safe from ridicule, safe from being laughed at, safe from being bullied, safe from shame, safe from, we want, we want to stay safe. But the spiritual path actually asks us to leap off the cliff into the not safety, the unsafety, the unknown, the uncertainty, you don't fucking know. The spiritual path asks us to go directly into terror. And this is why there's this thing that can happen whereby we're on the path carrying trauma, doing our best to do all of the healing and all of the things and da 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 da, but we loop, we loop, and we loop, because we're never doing what's required to go into the terror, because the terror is terrifying, right, it's fucking terrifying, and people will do anything they can to avoid terror, and on the path originally, you know, we, there would be gurus, there would be masters, there would be someone there that is holding you with their energy body and their nervous system so as you go through the process there's that feeling of being held and knowing that you are held by the mother right which about the mother kalima right? knowing that you are being held gives the safety required so that the safety mechanisms generated because of the trauma can dissolve, can let go. And right? if you don't have that, you can't. You can't. And you know, I've been finding my way on this path and I haven't necessarily really had a teacher per se and it's been fucking hard because of it. I've still found my way. Where my journey has taken me is practice has become my refuge. Practice became my refuge. Every single day since probably 2006, I have practiced in multiple ways. I practice for hours a day sometimes. You know, like when I'm really in the darkness, I'll just practice for four or five hours because that's my refuge and I feel safe there. And because there's a felt sense of safety, I can let whatever the conditioning is, whatever that's coming up, I can let it dissolve. Right? And I've started to work with mantra a lot. Um, the main practice that I was working with since 2010 is called Uchara, raising the Om. And it works with Bija mantra sounds. But in the last few years, I've really started to work with, in particular, Kali mantra. Kali, she is the mother. 
and she's the devourer. Right? Kali was birthed from Durga's forehead when Durga was fighting the demon king. And every time that Durga would slice at the demon king, he would bleed and every drop of blood, it would clone himself. And Durga's like, what the fuck, dude? Like, how do I deal with this? And so, boom, Kali is born out of the third eye. And Kali, with her tongue, she begins to catch every single drop of blood before it lands and clones the demon king and she eats it all up. She devours the blood of the demon king. And I feel like this is what happens with our trauma is that when we do not address our trauma, it clones itself out into the world and generates more trauma and more trauma. And when we have the courage to call on Kali or whomever we're working with and we devour our pain and we devour our trauma and we learn how to digest it by building our capacity to be embodied and to be awareness, then it dissolves. Then it dissolves. And then it dissolves. And so Kali's become a refuge for me. You know, it's just like, ah. Oh, my teacher, Shiva Ray, you know, there's been moments in my life when I just need to feel into her and I feel her come up and just hold me and hug me. You know, we're not meant to walk this path alone. We are not meant to be on the spiritual path alone. And the thing with trauma, particularly early childhood trauma, particularly abuse trauma, is that it makes us scared of humans. And when we are scared of humans, how do we open up and be vulnerable? How do we trust? How do we reach out for each other? You know, people are always like, oh, you're having a hard time, reach out and call someone. And I'm like, do you know how hard it is when you're in the darkness feeling what you're feeling to reach out to someone right it is so hard and then the risk that that person doesn't have the capacity to hold you or to meet you and does something that re-triggers the trauma that you're dealing with right and so what I've recognized now like in Tantra yoga there's deity yoga there is guru yoga I've received no formal teachings in this. I've just like synthesized and felt into it. But I really recognize that the need to have something, someone that is beyond you, that you trust 100%, that you can open to, that you can give yourself to, that you can fall apart in front of. Whether it is Kali, whether it is Papatu or Nuku, right? Is to have that. and. To start there if you find it challenging with people, <laughs> but to also recognize that the path, we're here doing it together. Like, I mean, I, I'm feeling like we're in a place now where the mm, separation or the delineation or the idea of teacher student is just dissipating. You know, I, I sit here in front of you, not so much as a teacher, but just someone who's walking the path and has given herself wholeheartedly to it for decades and so I come here just to share the view from where I happen to sit right now and to say hey that path that path's pretty good but watch out for the bear in the woods there you know <laughs> whatever it might be uh, so I'm going to go to questions in a moment but I want to see if I can just sort of summarize trauma in the spiritual path your trauma will come up on the path you will go deeper into the darkness quite likely than you thought was possible. You will encounter terror and fear. This is normal. This is natural. It does not believe that you are broken, that you are flawed, that you are fucked up, that there is something wrong with you. It does not mean that you even need fixing, healing, or resolving even, right? That which you are is unbroken. And so if you can touch that part of you that is infinite and unchanging and eternal and perfect and let that part of you hold the human as such, that helps. 
that really helps. Right. Get embodied. Learn how to orientate to awareness. Find teachers that resonate, that understand things deeply, that understand the relational nature of the path. And what I mean by the relational nature of that, if you are working with a teacher within a community, your relational patterns will come up. And that means the way you see and interact with the teacher, your shit will come up in relationship to the teacher. And you need to learn how to own your reactivity, how to own your shit, because most, many, some teachers have no idea how to deal with that, right? And to recognize that no matter what happened to you, that whatever um, patterns, etc., arose, those patterns are there to keep you safe, and they will have kept you safe. Particularly if you were a child, you needed to behave, you needed to be the good girl, maybe, so you didn't get beaten or whatever it was. So to recognize that your patterns of behavior that you may feel frustrated with, that you're like, fuck, I can't believe I'm still doing that thing. Love those patterns and recognize that they served a purpose, that they were valuable. And it's okay to let them know that they can retire now that you've got it, you know. Mm. Any questions, reflections, insights from anyone on anything that has been spoken so far? Notice if your heart's beating a little fast because you want to speak and it feels a little bit like, oh my God, just notice that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you find teachers? How do you find teachers? And then I'll go to you in the back, yeah. How do you find teachers? Okay. When I found Shiva Ray, I, like I started teaching in 2006 and I didn't discover her until 2008, 2009. I wasn't certified. <laughs> I taught uncertified for a while, five years or so. Um, and I was looking. I was looking for a teacher. And for me, what it was, it was recognition. When I found Shiva, it was like I just, I, like I knew her. There was a recognition. Um, so in terms of finding teachers, check them out, suss them out, be skeptical, be curious, recognize that teachers have their own shit as well. You know, there's no perfection there. You're not looking for perfection. You're looking for someone who can meet you and support you and walk alongside you as you navigate your particular journey. They're not there to be the authority or the expert. They're there to point you towards your own wisdom and your own knowledge. So research, checking out, and look for recognition, right? And recognize that there will be likely many teachers. I mean, I always thought I hadn't found a teacher, I hadn't found a teacher, I hadn't found a teacher, and then I realized it's because I had this narrow idea of what I thought a teacher was like and how they would show up. And then I was like, holy, I've been denying Shiva as my teacher for so long. And then I just started to orientate to her and to honor her again and then felt like her wisdom come through. It was amazing. It was extraordinary. So recognize that the teacher you seek, you may have an image of what that is like. So to see if you can be open and curious and to recognize that teachers come in many forms. And there's a, there's a point on the path where like almost every moment can be a teaching or a teacher. And at the same time, it is beneficial if you find someone that you can work with in a personal relationship, because that is where the real shit comes up. And to have someone that can see your shit and hold you with love and just point you towards things can be really beneficial. Um, and don't underestimate the power of a good therapist as well. Like, it's really important, particularly if you know you're carrying a lot of trauma, the spiritual path is not the only thing. You want to also work with good therapists, particularly somatic therapists. And, you know, the things are becoming more interwoven. But that's how I would find a teacher. Research, clarity, openness, recognition. And then check out the other, check out the students and the vibe and the feel of it to see, mm, am I drinking Kool-Aid here or is this legit? 
and it's okay to drink the Kool-Aid sometimes. Just know you're doing it. Go in for a short time, get what you need, and then exit the building. <laughs> I'm going to go to the lady at the back first, and then you, sir. Yeah, great question. So the question is, are there phases that you go through with trauma? So what I notice, again, this is just my direct experience, what I notice is life will trigger me. And I use that word trigger in a very specific context. Trigger is an out of context reaction to what is happening now that suggests that the reaction that is happening in the body now to this present time circumstance is actually related to unprocessed stuff from the past right so triggers are fantastic because that's it's like oh i'm triggered excellent there we go it flushes the shit up and now this is the crucial point when there's the trigger and the shit comes up it's the it's a having your rituals your practices your go-to's and i'll share mine in a moment of how to devour, digest, and dissolve the trigger so that it, it starts to lessen and maybe dissipate altogether. And this is entirely possible because one of the things I see is that people get triggered and, and they then try and make sure that they don't have people do things that trigger, don't do that, it triggers me, <laughs> um, right? But then that's just trying to control, manage, and manipulate reality again in order to feel a particular way. And that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is increasing our ability to just be with whatever the fuck is happening. So with triggers, know that you can digest and dissolve them completely. And find out for yourself what mechanisms will support that, whether you work through them with a really good therapist. Um, for me, I do practice, and this is where the orientation to awareness becomes critical. You can, if you're identified in the trigger, Right? If you're identified in it, you're immersed in it, it's like the difference between drowning in the ocean and being in a really good kick-ass sailboat that's skimming across the surface of the ocean. That's the difference. And the ocean can be wild as, but you're riding the wildness or drowning in it. Right? So orientation to awareness means that I can have the most intense stuff coming up and I can be with it, I can allow it, I can feel the fuck out of it and let it just digest, 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 digest. And normally when I do that, sometimes memories might arise, sometimes insights might arise. And that process, when I first started going through it, might, took months and then it took weeks and then it took days. And, and now sometimes it can be done in a few hours, but sometimes it can take days it depends on the intensity of the underlying beliefs or the intensity of the stored emotion in the system that's arising right but that's one way is to kind of set your intention in terms of right right i'm not going to distract myself or suppress or deny triggers and often people get triggered and what do they do whatever makes them feel good chocolate biscuits scrolling whatever you know smoke a joint drink some beer have some wine have sex what's going to make me feel better but that doesn't actually address or resolve what's coming up, right? So that's one way to, to start to slowly, slowly recognize life will bring your shit up. And when it does bring your shit up, are you gonna eat it up? <laughs> Who likes eating shit, tantricas, um, right? And digest it? Or are you going to push it away, deny it, suppress it, whatever? Just make a choice. And over time, I can say that over time, digesting my shit over time has led to a pretty fucking epic life. Yeah. But I do feel all the things at the same time. If anyone was on Instagram this week and read my post about being in the darkness, anyone read that who's here? It's always curious. Yeah, a few nods. Yeah, yeah, totally. I write these posts and then I'm going to the festival and I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I need to do an update so people know what's <laughs> happened. <laughs> Because I went in with the support of a friend and digested that stuff on Tuesday night. Alrighty, does that answer your question, ma'am? Epic, dude with the glasses. Which would really be me. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm loving this stuff. You're giving a lot of, my head is loving the, the theory on it. Uh huh. <laughs> my body and some part of me just needs a story. 
I would love to hear like sometime that something has triggered you, some the process that you went through to eat the shit and what process you went through and what the result was, if you can remember it, because if you've done it well, you might yeah. remember it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Might be yeah, I mean, for me, I live in process. You know, when I'm on a dance floor, often things will be arising for me and I'll be digesting, devouring and dissolving and, you know, sometimes tears. And So, the, the yeah, a specific example. Okay, so I was living um, with my ex-partner and we had three kids between us and we were in a two-bedroom miners' cottage and it was locked down and it was level four and we'd all had to move in on the day of level four. And I don't, I don't really like kids that much, really. I have one, I love him, he's amazing, but I'm not really a kid person. And all of a sudden, we had three of them in a two-bedroom miners. Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck? And anyway, he had daughters, and they're beautiful. They're epic kids. Like, if there were ever kids I was going to fall in love with, and they're amazing. But the thing about trauma is that when you have children, as those children go through their ages and stages, they will trigger. If, if they're four and you had your childhood trauma installed at the age of four, guess what happens? It triggers your shit. So there I am, locked down level four in a two-bedroom apartment with three kids and daughters, which I'd never had. And obviously I was a daughter once and I had a sister, same age gap as these daughters. And what began to happen was my childhood trauma started getting triggered. And it was so intense. I, w I was going into, I could feel rage. I wanted to fucking burn the cottage down, wow. right? And so I'm there and I'm like, trying really hard to contain the rage because I do not want to export that rage onto any of the children and my partner was fucking amazing incredible man so good at holding space so incredibly caring and he trusted me deeply and so I was just like I'm gonna fucking explode with rage he's like gets the kids out of the way and like lets me be in the bedroom and I'm just like I'm literally vibrating with the intensity of the rage and then what starts to happen because I feel like I'm going to destroy everything I feel like I'm going to destroy the relationship and it's like the sense of like I destroyed that relationship and I'm never going to have relationships because I'm so fucked up and all that shit starts to come up and as it starts to come up these beliefs etc I'm still in awareness and then it's like fucking self-hatred I'm like, I fucking hate myself. I fucking hate this shit. I'm still in awareness. I'm not believing it. I'm not identified with it. It's really strong. Like when the intensity is that strong to like stay in awareness. So I throw myself on the bed and I just go into child's pose. It's one of my go-tos, child's pose, so good. Just go into child's pose and I'm just in child's pose and I'm breathing and I might've turned into Shiva Ray and I'm just, acknowledging self-hatred and I had no idea until that moment that I was carrying such intense self-hatred so there was a part of me that was really grateful that it was being flushed out so I'm just feeling it and I'm sobbing and I'm feeling it and I'm sobbing it and I'm just letting it move through and I might have put mantra on and I am just being with it and I don't know how long it took it might have been a couple of hours of just and my partner bless him bless him he would have come in and he probably would have bought me cups of tea and he would have checked on me. And this is the critical thing, right? He did not reject me in my darkness. He did not push me away and say, how dare you be a rageful, wrathful, self-hatred, fucked up kind of woman. He accepted and loved me completely. And that was the healing that was required. It was absolutely critical. Our wounds are created in relationship. Our wounds are healed in relationship. So the combination for me of having that incredible trigger come up of feeling all of this rage, which was at childhood stuff, which generated all the things I just explained to you, but then being held and cared for and loved meant that unlike what happened here, I was able to digest and devour and the love was unwavering and the recognition that it doesn't define me it's not who I am that is not who I am it is just emotion passing through the system so that was that's an example of what happens for me if I get triggered which happens less and less now but it, there was a period there at lockdown for two months I was probably in that darkness every day for two months 
it was that intense because it was the surfacing of stuff I didn't even know was there. I just kept showing up to it. I kept using all my tools. My partner kept holding the love relentlessly and supporting me. And because I, I had the cognitive understanding of knowing the process, I wasn't believing and identifying, creating story. I was just going for the guts of the feeling. How does that feel in my body? How does that feel in my body? And just feeling, feeling, feeling. And I, I trained myself over years because it took a long time to train myself out of disassociation, right? To train myself to feel, to be able to do this. Um, yeah. Does that? And, and your life shifted from that process in, in a way. Yeah. Well, uh, does my life shift from that process? Uh, life is shifting every moment of every day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it excavated and surfaced stuff I didn't know was there and began a really big healing process. And that's been a journey over the last three or four years because there's many, 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 many tendrils and layers of patterns around that, particularly in the relational field. You know, and this is, this is the danger, right? If you get stuck on this idea of when I'm fixed, when I'm healed, when I sort this shit out, now, I, ain't, I mean, who fucking knows? It may just be that this particular avatar that I'm embodying in this particular incarnation may always have certain patterns of behavior because that's the programming. But that is not who I am. What I am is awareness itself, animating the being, right? And so this idea of trying to get to some idea of perfection as a person, fucking burn that shit too, right? We are what we are. And yes, it's beneficial to dissolve the triggers and dissolve the patterns so that we can be free and spontaneous in our moment-to-moment -moment interactions rather than going into a habitual pattern reaction, you see? Yeah, but it's still, you know, there is no perfect point here. Um, so enjoy the journey, relax, you know, chill out on the landing as you're climbing the mountain check out the sunset right enjoy those moments when the like you know sometimes the bliss that comes through particularly on dance floors and at festivals but also my day-to-day -day life like watching the birds eat the leftover peanut butter sandwiches for my son's lunch in the morning like it's it, it's extraordinary you know like they come and they're doing their little bird thing you know and i wonder if they're like oh yeah peanut butter sandwiches 101 St. Patrick Row about 8.30 a.m. school mornings, guys. Do they put the word out? You know? Right? This is life. The miniature, the littleness, the all of it. And if you, what I notice, if I get too hung up on, like, I gotta fix here. No, fuck. Enjoy. Rejoice. Celebrate. Dance. And even in the midst of it, you know, even in the midst of it, to do that. Yeah. the topic of finding a therapist or teacher how do you tell the difference between a high quality one that works for you or a low quality one <laughs> how to tell the difference between a high quality teacher that works for you and a low quality one what you're really asking me is how do i trust myself mm. <laughs> right so it's honing your own ability to sense and feel the current of life what are you drawn to? What are you attracted to? Recognizing that sometimes what you're attracted to may... I mean, I think of teachers like Osho, controversial, etc. Many, many different experiences, and you, know, you can say this or that. So I feel like I've just opened up a rabbit hole here. To recognize that every experience has beauty. So even if you end up with a shitty-ass teacher, and you begin to realize that there's a reason you're there, or at least there's, you know, if you tune in and, and recognize and go, oh, I was seduced by their popularity and I mistook their popularity for depth. Huh, I wonder where else I'm seduced by popularity over depth, right? So it doesn't actually matter, is what I'm saying to you in some ways, is whatever shows up in front of you, be with that fully and see what it is. Interact until you don't interact. Mm. It's probably not the answer you wanted, right? <laughs> yeah. Is it possible that something like dance and yoga, which I really enjoy both those things, are really important to me and I do dance as a job. Is it 
possible something like that can be an escape and not really be helping you? Yeah, oh, great question. Is it possible that dance, yoga, meditation can be an escape and not really helping you? Yes, absolutely. Anything can be an addiction or an escape, right? And anything can be medicine. It is all about how you relate to the thing, how you engage with the thing. So that's the, you know, what to tune into. Does what you're doing, dance, yoga, does it bring you closer into the real? Does it allow you to feel and be with deeply what is true right now? Yeah. And at the same time, sometimes it's kind of fun to escape and just, you know, and, and that's okay too to just like get high on by dancing your ass off to flash dance or something, you know? Yeah. yeah. But it's a, it be, just notice, notice. And the other piece of that is if you notice that you're using things to escape, notice if you feel bad about it or notice if it makes you feel guilty or ashamed and to recognize that as a layer of judgment, right? And to recognize that in any given moment, every single one of us, based on our level of conditioning and our trauma and everything that has ever happened to us in our entire life, in any given moment, each one of us is doing the best we can. Right? And whatever's happened has happened. If you've escaped, that's okay. If you feel yourself go to escape, choose. Either don't, or if you do, wholeheartedly do it. Just give yourself to it. No need for guilt, shame, fear. Mm. Two things. One is, um, they say that um, we come in with a soul contract that we sign up to the vision of who God makes us sign up for the universe, all the crap that is about to land on us once we get born. Um, so I just wonder if you feel there's any truth in that. It's yeah. very brutal. And the second part is, once the crap arrives and installs in your brain through abuse and neglect, etc., they say that what's in our head manifests out into reality, and so reality is just a mirror. And so mm. if you carry this shit, the reality it's like a reinforcement. Yeah. It's hard work. So how do you, what do you make? I can speak to that. Um, so this idea that we have a soul contract, blah blah, etc., etc., righty ra, it's a construct. Right? It's a construct, it's a way of perceiving reality. Like everything is a construct. Capitalism is a construct. Tantra is a construct. Tantra knows it's a construct though. It's like, yeah, it's a construct and you use it until you don't need it anymore. So the thing with the construct, right, a belief in essence, a way of viewing reality is to simply ask the question, is this useful? Right? Because none of it's true. I mean, soul contracts with God, whatever, you know. Is it useful? Is it useful? That's what I always ask. Is it useful that I perceive reality through this particular lens? And be aware it's a lens, it's not reality itself. Right? It's an overlay. Just as Tantra is an overlay, it's not reality itself. And eventually you no longer need the overlays, you directly pierce the nature of reality. Um, second question in terms of how reality functions. Um, yeah, so we do, my, my experience is that whatever's happening internally, there is a projection to the external that filters or conditions how reality itself is experienced. So for example, if I had a belief that people are not safe, then as I'm going through my day-to-day -day life, I deeply believe people are not safe, and so I'm suspicious, or on edge, or slightly paranoid possibly, or whatever it is, and so I'm looking through that lens, and it's quite likely that I will perceive that people are not safe, whether they're safe or not, you see. Um, so this is true, and this is what we talk about Maya, or illusion, the delusion of reality, is that most of us are not actually experiencing reality directly. We experience reality through the mechanism of the mind. We think about things, right? And then we think about life, and we think about people, we think about circumstances. And people will argue to the point of death sometimes over their perception of reality. It's this, that movie was a fucking epic movie, it's such a good movie, and that's a shitty fast. It's like, guys, it's both. 
for you, you it was a great movie. For you, it was a shitty movie. Both of these things are true. The movie is just what it is. It is neither good nor shitty. It is just movie, you see. So, yeah. Yeah. Could you please speak a little bit more to if you're in a relationship and you're on the path, mm-hmm. one is maybe further on the path than the other, triggers of trauma, yeah. uh, how to hold space for that and navigate that so that you're not running away or yeah. going together. Yeah. Epic. Okay, so relationships on the path. This may be my next book. It's been floating <laughs> in the ether for a while. Um, okay. So if you're in a relationship and you're both on the path, but one may be further ahead or not. Okay, the first thing I would say if you're in a relationship is to be really clear on your intentions. Is the intention to cling to the relationship and make it work at all costs? Or is your intention to align to truth and love no matter what, right? Or liberation, for example. So to be really clear about what are we doing here in this relationship? Are we here to comfort each other? Are we here to provide security? Are we here because we're lonely? None of that's wrong. Just identify it. It's like, yeah, but the clarity over what you're both doing helps because then you're on the same page for a start, right? Second thing is to recognize that, yes, relationships are going to bring up all your shit. This is what happens. And ideally, it's really awesome. With my last partner, this has happened. One of us would get triggered and the other would not be. And then the other would get triggered and the other would not be, which was so fortunate because we, we were just taking turns holding space. It was like, this is great. Like, you know, we're not triggered at the same time. So we weren't playing into each other. Uh, so it's a lot easier if one of you is triggered. And if you're able to recognize, oh, this is just shit coming out. So I'm not going to take it too seriously. I'm not going to buy into it. And to be able to name it, whether you're the person triggered, to be able to acknowledge, fuck, I'm triggered right now, I'm feeling really insecure, and I'm acting like a controlling bitch, because that's what happens when I feel insecure. So just don't take me too seriously, but I'm just going to be all insecure for a moment. Can you, and, yep, sweet, got you, babe, just going to hold that, yep, got it, sweet. Right, so it really does help to name and acknowledge the thing. Um, and to take responsibility, to own your reactivity, right? So for me, when that intense rage got triggered, I did not export or vent the rage onto my partner or the children. I did not make it about the current situation. I did not start going into a rage about any, you know, I just recognized, shit, rage coming up, out of context, this is mine. It's got nothing to do with you or the circumstance. It's really helpful to be able to acknowledge that. Just a note, this is high level functioning, you know, because you've got to be able to stay aware be embodied, recognize what's happening, don't get identified, don't buy into the story, and name this stuff in real time. But it's entirely possible, entirely possible. Know what your, know what your practices, etc., are for dissolving things, know what your triggers are, know what happens in your nervous system. Like I would go into disassociation where I literally would freeze at the same time and I couldn't actually talk. I'd be like that in the living room. My partner would look at me and he'd be like, I got you, babe. You're in disassociation and freeze. Okay, cool. And, it, and it's like we'd have the operating manual. <laughs> okay, when she's like this, this is what I do. <laughs> so that can be helpful to support each other in terms of like, this is what happens for me when I go into, do, I, do you go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, or what do you do when your trauma comes up? Yeah, that's what I was getting to. So first we've got to have all your systems, know what to do, righty right. Okay, now what happens when both of you get triggered at the same time? Whoever has the most capacity to orientate to awareness, it's their responsibility to fucking do it. Push pause on your own trigger. I got you, babe. It's possible, you know, and or to just say to each other, we're both triggered, you want to go at it? And, and just... <laughs> and, but you're setting the container, right? You set the container, we're both triggered as fuck, let's go at it. Knowing we're not taking it seriously, we're not believing it, we're just... And be really fucking aware. Because if you go at it and you're really, 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 really aware, you can burn it up. But you've got to stay connected. You've got to recognize that we're just going to play out that shit together right now. You just... 
what? You know? But if you, yeah. No one do this on my advice and come back to me and say, this is not advice. This is what I would do, okay? Please use at your own risk. You do need to have high levels of embodiment, of space holding, of awareness to do it. But there is nothing better than romantic relationship with all the things to whoo, on the path. You can go, oh, especially one once you bring your sex into that. Yeah, the sex afterwards. Oh, yeah. Does that answer your question? So where was the disclaimer form that we signed? Yeah. <laughs> right? I know. Totally. I can see myself getting ripped apart on social media after, do you know what she said? And then, da, da. I'm like, oh, my God. I have a recording. You guys can listen to it. Oh, hang on, because you want me, anyone, yes. Hi, um, I just have like two kind of questions. Speak real loud. I just would like to know about the body and ancestral trauma. I believe that I got disease from my father who had a lot of ancestral trauma. Yep. I can actually feel it in my gut. Yep. And I was hearing you say digestive and dissolving. I believe I'm digesting, but I'm not dissolving. Therefore, I have really bad problems with my guts. Yeah. And I just want to know what's like the best way spiritually for you to dissolve it and let it go. Mm. And also another thing I just wanted to ask is also, what do you do? Because I get really angry, and I'm trying to deal with my rage and my truth and how strong I stand in my truth. But if someone else's reality is something else, and how do I deal with it? Oh, the anger over over me what do I do in that step to really go well I'm really angry like I know I walk away but like just to really calm my nerves up because I get so shaken up yeah okay so let's start with the first question first uh, pra- so I'm going to go back to practice for a moment right my understanding of the yogis and the tantrikas pre the last hundred years or so they weren't doing this psychological shit so much what they were doing was practicing Practicing, 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 practicing. And practice will eat your shit up. But you also need to be doing beneficial practice and not necessarily just physical yoga. So for example, there is an ancestral karma prostration practice which eats up your ancestral karma where you don't have to cognitively figure shit out or do You just do the practice. And I've worked with this practice. I did it every day for over a year and it most definitely ate up ancestral karma. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so, and there's, there are, you know, the practices that eat the shit up, that's the ones you want, uchada practice. Another good example, because it eats shit up for you. So the first thing I say is if you are experiencing a lot of trauma stuff coming through, double down on practice. Really do the, and figuring out which practices are going to be beneficial for you. I know that can be challenging, and you know, it's really great if you've got a teacher that you can work with who can support you on that. And then, as we've discovered, finding the teacher can be challenging too. So, that's what I'd say on the ancestral karma. And I'd also recognize that whilst the physical reaction might be coming from the ancestral karma, to just always recognize that you maybe can't know for sure. And even if maybe all the karma gets eaten up, there may still be the physical reaction. It doesn't, you know, like just to always be in the unknown or the uncertainty around things. Like, eh, this might be what's going on. I'm going to attend to it like it is. But, you know, and sometimes, we, you know, I mean, I've got a fused spine. I'm always going to have a fused spine my whole life. That's just the way it is. Um, but that's not to say that you'll always have gut stuff your whole life. But you know what, you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. All right, the second piece on the anger. It's really, I mean, it's challenging for me to say, yeah, when the situation happens for you, do X, Y, and Z, and, you know, but I still want to speak to it. Um, What I've found beneficial is that when I'm in a situation with my child or with another person and there's a lot of anger arising, if I just name it, I'll be like, I'm feeling really fucking angry right now. That's the first thing. Because as soon as you name or acknowledge, it helps to create that awareness of rather than the, than the identification of it, right? So that's the first thing. And then if you can tune into what do I need right now? So you, you've named it, feeling really fucking angry right now. And if you can tune in, I need, I need to go out to the garden and scream at the avocado tree. You know, whatever it might be. 
but to just tune in what do I need right now and to communicate that to the person that you're with and then just do what you need right what does your nervous system need to recalibrate and calm down naming and acknowledging where you are tuning into what you need doing what you need it's kind of simple in some ways yeah. but yeah Thank you. you're welcome what happens if when you name it the person that's responding to you responds in like a oh like a not so space holding space and it triggers you further yeah, I mean, some of that's going to happen. Like, I mean, A, it's really good to, for everyone to increase their ability to hold space. Did we even have that phrase five years ago? <laughs> like, right? It's like, yeah, I'm a really good space holder. What? Um, I mean, shit's going to go down. And if that, you know, if that person then is angry at you, just name it. I'm noticing that you're being really angry toward me and I'm noticing that I've, I'm feeling increased level of trigger. Uh, you know, like there, there, just often what happens is we're in the thing and we're acting out the thing, right? Like the actor that's forgotten that they're an actor. And taking it to that meta level of just acknowledging and being aware of what's happening with the body-mind interface in this particular interaction. <laughs> No expectations. Got it. Yeah, you got to burn all the expectations for everything. That's a good place to start to minimize suffering. Yeah. Um, just in relation to the subject of terror. Yeah. Um, it feels to me that it may be related to the subject of the fear of death. Yes. And potentially yes. Suffering. Absolutely. So, Awareness is not positive, and it's not like awareness just is. There's no qualities to awareness. It's neither positive nor negative. Or it could but, be something more negative, worse than something. Like, yeah. Um, like whatever happened happened to me, and then people find their identity in that. Yes. So the, the degree to which there's a propensity to identify with something, mm. that degree mm. brings us terror and spiritual. Mm-hmm. Fuel that. So can you speak to that? Yeah. Sure, I can speak to that. I love how you just put that. It's, it's freaking beautiful because it's so bang on. So for those that may not have heard, just speaking about how in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, how the final klesha or ignorance right before awakening is the fear of death. It's the fear of death. And this isn't just the physical fear of death. It's also the fear of psychological death as such. It's like death of who you think you are. And this is the really interesting thing about the spiritual path is the, the one we're identified with is doing the thing to annihilate that one. How can you annihilate that which you think you are? It's a, a right? So what I, what I know is like on the tantric paths, there's a lot of practices. I haven't had this experiences in the work that I've done, but I know from some of the books I've read, there's the practices that directly are about dealing with fear, where tantricas will be sent into the woods with wild animals to meditate so that they feel really fucking scared, so that they can meet the fear, devour and digest it and no longer be afraid of the fear. And the reason for that is exactly what you're saying, that as the move along the path is that fear or terror is guaranteed to come up. Right? But if you're able to meet it then the likelihood of being able to go through it as such is increased that's my understanding of it and so I know in my own practice now whenever fear arises I had a lot of fear come up on Tuesday night because I was on a group call and got I was invited to be the demo model for an emotional clearing in front of a bunch of people which is like and my heart started beating so fast and I realized I'm like shit I'm really scared right now. And so as soon as I realized that I was really scared, it's like, okay, cool, let's be with this, let's meet this. And as soon as I orientated to that, my heart started to slow down. 
And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. So learning how to work with the fear or the terror is really important. And recognizing, I think there's another, there's another piece, I feel what you're kind of asking around. I love what you said in terms of the propensity to identify with. Because as like you drudge the canals, the waters of the canals, these deep rooted samskaras come to the surface. And until that water is completely clear, um, as they come to the surface, it's going to bring up you know, a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a question I've been asking myself in terms of what am I identified with? What am I attached to? I'm like, oh shit, what if I'm identified with dissolving trauma? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, because this stuff is sneaky. So then I'm like, oh, okay, so I'll just be aware of that tenant. Then what, what if I don't need to do that shit anymore? <gasps> but I know where I am with that. <laughs> so I'd say that that is like, yeah, I like that, that metaphor you used of like sludging the canals and the deeper shit starts to come up. Because what will often happen on the path is that, you know, people come on the spiritual path and they want to like dissolve the ego, etc. and righty round. then they just adopt the spiritual identity. And I know that I did this. You know, it's like, oh, this is who I am now. I'm a yogi. You know, now I feel safe because I'm a yogi and I can identify with that. Um, because we, we constantly cling or grasp for the thing that keeps us safe. So the way that I work with that is inquiry. What am I attaching to right now? What am I identified with right now? What's the thing that I'm unconscious of thinking I am? Yeah. So working with Tierra, being able to work with Tierra and relentless, ruthless inquiry. How do I know that's true? 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 Because there is no such thing as my truth and your truth, by the way. There is only truth. And truth is that which cannot be put into words. Truth is a felt sense. Truth just is. There is your perspective and my perspective, for sure. But truth beyond words cannot be named. But it can be known. You see. Does that give you a little something, something to chew on? <laughs> mm. Mm. Yes, in the far back. Um, is that ever successful to have a partner who is a major trigger in your relationship and be the teacher and the healer? So, so, is it successful to... Is it ever successful to have the partner as a trigger in a relationship, as a main trigger to someone, and that partner being a teacher and a healer? Ah, yeah. Ooh. Okay, so the question is, is it successful, I guess, or possible to have a partner who's a main trigger who is also a healer or a teacher? Possibly. It depends how good you are at navigating dual roles and being able to set aside things and orientate to awareness I mean I know that it's definitely more pro you know I mean I've worked in those capacities and I tend not to work with my partners or but at the same time a lot of I've worked with a lot of friends but I don't work with family members either because there's, there's too much karmic entanglement and that karmic entanglement is often unconscious so even when you think you're clear in doing the thing you yet yeah, it's not necessarily clear in doing the thing um, but at this, yeah, there's no hard and fast rules, it's not black and white. But I would suggest, you know, for me, if I'm in a romantic partner with someone, I don't really want to be in the role of teacher. But I also recognize that we will both be teaching each other, we will both be healing each other, and we will probably be each other's major triggers as well. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Oh, what is heartbreak? <laughs> I like how you ask like I have answers to these things. <laughs> when I when I start to feel into heartbreak, I start to feel it. 
you know? It's like, it's a gateway. Heartbreak's a gateway. And what, we, what I do about it is I immerse in it and I embrace it and I bow before it and I devote myself to it and I let myself up. Just be broken over and over again. Because if you're no longer afraid of heartbreak, see how the truth isn't in words. She asked me what heartbreak is, and it's it's a feeling. It's you know, and when I feel it, you feel it, right? Yeah. <laughs> What happened? Oh, she broke, we all broke our hearts together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. So the question is, as I'm doing more somatic work, I'm having bigger feelings. I don't always know why I'm having the feeling. doesn't matter. Um, I was on a call with um, a colleague of mine, and he gave this beautiful metaphor in terms of when you notice you've got dirt on your shoulder, you just jump in the shower and clean it off. You don't necessarily go, oh my god, where did that dirt come from? Was it when I lay down at the chai tea? Was it when that guy like put his hands on my shoulders? Like, oh my God, where did the dirt? No, you just clean the dirt off, right? And so in some ways it, it doesn't matter in the slightest. And what I've noticed is that the desire to know why or where it comes from is a really sneaky mechanism for avoiding and getting out of actually just feeling the fuck out of the feeling. Yeah. And so what I suggest is when the big feelings are coming through, just devour those, digest them, be with them. And sometimes, naturally, what will happen is insight will arise, memory will arise, an aha moment. And if that happens, wonderful. Oh, the dirt came from when I was dancing in the electronic stage. But I, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it might come through. Don't let it, don't let that sneakiness of the mind that wants to protect, use the why is the way to not feel the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was just reflecting on some of these teachings and remembering how um, what came to me was like how our emotional body and our feeling body is actually the mechanism, the natural mechanism to digest everything up. Uh -huh. And like I just started putting awareness on that. Oh, I've actually got everything in me to process and digest what's happening, whether it's an overwhelming positive Yes. And just by like trusting that my I sometimes I don't have enough words of words of feelings to put on what I'm feeling. And like noticing the story that's there with the feeling, but it's not yet the story of the feeling. Yeah. And that sometimes feels like so challenging to like what you were just thinking about now, just to allow to feel what's coming out of yeah. it. Yeah, this is, this is a crucial piece. Thank you for bringing it up, because I don't think I've spoken to it yet. So, just for the sake of the recording, the question was around noticing the feelings, recognizing that there's everything possible needed in the system to digest it, but recognizing the stories that get generated about the feelings. So this is critical in terms of when it comes to digestion, you have to be able to surrender this story, right? If you're in the story, around the feeling the teaching is this isn't tantra illuminated so we're talking about um, within tantra there are the skillful means to liberation upaya and there's the empowered means or shakta upaya so when christopher wallace is speaking about this he's talking about the digestion of samskara which can be po i don't like to use positive and negative ben like ones we love and ones we don't love so much um, you can absolutely have joy that you weren't capable of fully feeling that arises and gets triggered, believe it or not. 
Um, so sand scatters are not always uncomfortable, painful things. It's just what you couldn't digest at the time because you're either your energy body wasn't strong enough, and I'll come back to that, or your um, willingness or desire to do it and your internal mechanisms just cut you off from it. So you do need to be able to set aside or surrender the story because if you're holding on to the story in terms of like he did this to me and that's why I'm feeling this and he shouldn't have done that and blah 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 and blah, 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 you cannot digest right you can acknowledge sometimes it's really important to acknowledge the story acknowledge what happened and speak to it can be very important which is why therapy can be really beneficial at times um, and then once you've got that clear on the cognitive level, then it's just like, okay, it's done. I, you know, I'm just going to feel. How does it make me feel? When I go into that story, how does it make me feel? I feel envy or whatever it is. And then just feel that with the story set aside. Really critical. Um, just looping back to what I said around the energy body. So in the tantric frameworks, recognizing this too is a construct that we use. It's beneficial. Physical body mental emotional body energetic body void layer and then consciousness itself so the energy body prana shakti prana it has strength right so depending on what practices you do depending on your uh, breath work etc it will be strong or not so strong or whatever it is the stronger your energetic body the more capacity that you have to digest intensity Every time you digest a samskata, right? When a samskata is stored in the system, the way Christopher Wallace speaks to it, that emotion gets stored, it locks up some of our energy body and our energy body becomes weaker, right? So if you have a shit ton of unresolved trauma because if you've had a really tough childhood, your energy body is gonna be pretty damn weak, which is why then the yogic practices are really important to start to build up your energy body again so that you have the capacity to digest a samskara, which then releases the energy back into your energy body and your energy body gets a lot stronger. So one thing I've noticed from doing all of this digestion over the last eight years is it feels like my energy body is so fucking strong and my capacity to digest and to meet other people's shit, like I have no fear of meeting, no matter what someone comes to me with, I will happily support them to digest it, knowing that that's only going to make my energy body stronger as well as theirs. Right? So when I talked about embodiment and orientation to awareness, another piece I would add to that is to increase the strength of your energy body by doing energy body practices. Right? In the back there, yes. Talk loud. Can you heal a trauma real quick? And also, is it possible that you're trying to heal something that's not really healed? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Can you heal a trauma real quick? Yes, totally, absolutely. Is it possible you're healing some, trying to heal something that's already healed? I mean, anything is possible, so the answer has to be yes from a logical perspective. Right? What I'm curious about is what's underlying the questions that you're asking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we love to get fixated on all kinds of things. It makes us feel good when we have things to fix. When we try and uncover things and, ah, oh, now I can sort this out, now I can sort this out. You know? Um, there needs to be, I'm not going to use the word balance, I don't like that word. But there needs to be a recognition that what we're doing here is learning how to immerse in and rejoice in reality as it is. Don't even fucking worry about healing anything. You're fucking perfect. And your shit will come up. So meet it and digest it as you're rejoicing and celebrating. So it's almost like switching the priority in some ways. Because I, you know, I know for myself, like fucking ending up in the psych ward and coming out and feeling like a failure. My life had imploded and nobody loves me and all that shit. I was so focused on healing right so focused like myopic focus I'm gonna sort my shit out um, but what I recognize now is it meant that for those how many years I was myopically focused in that way I wasn't enjoying life as much as I could have been and there was just as much to enjoy in those moments I just wasn't seeing it because my focus was there 
right? So I, in, in this journey to recognize that if you focus on marveling at all of the things, you know, your shit's going to come up anyway and just attend to it. And then marvel and rejoice and delight and dance and dance and dance some more. Yeah. Mm. All right, we're coming to, I think, I think I'm presuming this is a 90 minute session. I'm going to presume that. So we're coming to sort of the last five minutes. Any final questions? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, who's a little shy about maybe asking? Do you offer your teachings? Do I offer my teachings? Well, I have my book here for sale, and this box is really heavy, so I would freaking love to sell out. It's actually the last box of printed ones I have. 40 bucks, sex, drugs, and mostly yoga. So this is my memoir of being in the darkness. You get to go into the darkness with me, and you get to, and it's like experiential, right? So I'm applying the yogic tools and the yogic framework as I go through the darkness. Um, I wrote this five years ago now, and it feels like another lifetime. I'm really curious to know what I, what I would write if I was to write another <laughs> memoir. I read it, it's great. Mm, please, please. Um, it's also on Audible for those of you that like to download. Um, in terms of teachings, I'm in an interesting space right now where there is nothing new on offer at this exact moment. I do not know what is going to happen when I emerge. <laughs> you mentioned the uh, karmic, karmic entanglements. You yes, with karmic banning. entanglements. Does that mean that you believe in karma? It's karma from the past or the current? What do you mean? Okay, so karmic entanglement. What I mean is that if I eat a burger, the karma is that I'm going to have to take a shit at some point. <laughs> right? That's what karma is. It is what happens because of what happened. It is what's set in motion. It is the patterns. And whenever we take an action, we're usually doing that action from attachment or from aversion or from confusion. And so when we act from attachment, aversion, or confusion, that basically sends out more attachment, aversion, and confusion into the pattern, and that is what continues to happen. So it's not that I believe in karma any more than I believe in maths. <laughs> right? Yeah, but it, it, it's just the, the way that things unfold. You know, if you leave a tent out in the sun, the karma of that will be that the tent fades. But, but, that seems true, but then there are people who go through life like a knife, hot knife through butter, mm -hmm. gone on cut. Karma should be everywhere, damage everywhere, but nothing. Well, you don't, you don't, you have no idea what the internal world of Donald Trump is like. That, I mean, that's one thing you don't know. And and the thing is, like, from a yogic perspective, it's not just a lifetime. It is thousands of lifetimes, thousands of lifetimes. So where he is in terms of the ignorance and the shutdown, like, bless that man because the journey potentially that will unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold, right? And yeah, and to, rec to recognize that, like blessings on that man, because at some point, you know, we have to pay the piper, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, one more question. We've probably got time for one more question. Are we done? Are we hot? Are we ready to get out of this little sauna? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, do you have any advice about taking the practice if you're feeling relaxed and at ease into a more emotional space, etc.? I mean, what I would say is you don't need to do shit to bring up your shit. If your shit's not coming up, fucking enjoy it. <laughs> like, enjoy that, right? And notice that it might not come up on the mat, but what are your relationships like? What happens when you're engaging with people? And just recognize and work with the things that come up. Are you going after your desires? Are you living your dreams? Like, you know, one really good way to bring the shit up is to get really clear on what you desire and wholeheartedly move in that direction because everything that's in the way will arise. Right? And, and going for your desires 
it's kind of a, it's a more fun way <laughs> because maybe you'll actually live all the way into those desires or discover that they weren't really your desires at all and just a product of conditioning because you were trying to be the good girl and make everybody like you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll go bigger than then over here, yeah. I just wanted to say that you're a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> I think I always want, I wanted to be flash dance, you know? Yeah, yeah thanks, Begum. <laughs> I wonder if you could um, give your perspective on the differences between needs, wants, and desires. Oh, Ooh, needs, wants, and desires. Yeah. All right, this will be the last thing I answer, and I'll just reflect needs, wants, and needs they keep the avatar functioning at an optimal level you need water or you will die within what is it four days eight maybe right you need food or you will die in however long you need shelter or you know you need love you need touch we need these things or we shrivel and die that's what a need is a want is more like oh I want that piece of cake because you know it's going to be really good and you just want to have that piece of cake. Yeah, that's a want. Um, desire. Hmm. It feels like desire. Desire just feels like it's, it's like the current of life. Desire is the current of life. It is the desire of life to know itself, to life to express itself, to life to be what it is. You know, a desire is like when Blaze starts playing on the dance floor and it's like, oof, a desire to dance, you know? It's incredible. Um, yeah, I'm feeling like the difference between wants and desire to me feels like it is life itself expressing and coming through it is the goddess like from a tantric perspective the way that reality is perceived is that shiva was meditating on the mountain all by himself and everything was stillness and spaciousness and emptiness and then he got kind of bored <laughs> and out of that began to arise desire and movement and energy which gets embodied as Shakti and then Shakti becomes all the manifest form so that Shiva can know himself, Shakti, the same, same, one and the same, can know themselves as all the things. Shiva Shakti is like, what would it like to be a really traumatized person? I'm going to go play that out. You know, that's what happens. That's what happens. So desire to me feels like that. It's the desire to be life itself yeah yeah let's end on that oh blessings to you all mm. oh, so i will be up here i don't know when the next person's in here i'll be here if anyone wants a copy of this 40 bucks cash bank transfer trade I'm always open to trade. I'm always open to trade, you know. Otherwise, have an epic, amazing festival. No doubt I'll see some of you on dance floors. Go well. Go well. Go well. If you want a recording of this, come and give me your email address and I will give you a recording of that and nothing else unless you give me permission because consent is everything.